Hey, welcome back everybody. Jeff Frick here with theCUBE. We are at the uh, Auto Tech Council Innovation and in Motion Mapping and Navigation event uh, in Milpitas, California at the Western Digital offices here. Really interesting conversations going on in, in the, uh, the breakout rooms and the keynotes next door. You know, there's so many layers to this navigation thing, which is just one component in kind of the autonomous car story that it's just, you know, you just keep peeling back the onion and there's more and more and more, which is really fascinating. Uh, we're really excited to have Christian Kotcher join us. He's a CEO of Metro Tech. First of all, Christian, welcome. Thank you. So for those that aren't familiar, what does Metro Tech do? So Metro Tech is a smarter city data exchange. Um, so we use maps, we write on top of maps, but what we basically do is go to existing cities and counties and, and metro areas and take their existing sensors and the new ones they deploy. Uh, we bring that into our, uh, our cloud-based system uh, where we convert it into real-time traffic data. So if you've ever had Google Maps or, or, or Waze or some of these others, you've, you've used real-time traffic data. What we do is we enhance that by giving them real-time data. So using the actual video, turning it into actual speeds, actual counts, actual density. And then you can do more than just uh, you know, real time, you can start to do predictive because we take so many different elements like the lane level, the density. Uh, so it's, it's really big data for traffic. And then what we do on the exchange is we publish it out then. So we don't think it's just the cities, but it's the, the people driving on their streets. Right. So we've got to find a way to get it out for multiple use cases. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit more about the wrong way driver and safety alerts, but um, how do we get it out to somebody using Waze as well as somebody using Inrix, somebody using TomTom, somebody using Telenav, somebody using their Ford in-car vehicle. So we're basically setting up that necessary data exchange that allows smarter cities to speak with autonomous vehicles and connected cars. So that's what we've been building out in some key major cities, and now we're working on some major alliances to make this a de facto standard. So our goal is to become the, the verisign uh, of the smarter city, if you will. So somebody's got to organize this and somebody's got to publish it out, and it, it needs to be a neutral, trusted third party, and that's what Metrotech's building. Fascinating, Could, because there's so many elements, both on the in, the input and the output side, right? So as you said, yep. you take, ex if they have existing sensors, so we've all seen the cameras yep. on busy intersections, so you use that data, you use, probably, I'm sure they have new and better and faster types of sensors and stuff in the under the concrete, so you're using right. that, and then are you putting in your own sensors we as do well? Not. We're, we're agnostic, and we don't want to be in the hardware business, okay. we're software as a service only, and it's a data exchange. So you've seen exchanges in the past, right? In the right, advertising right. world, in right. the online traffic world, so we're now building an exchange for uh, for the smarter city in the autonomous world. And in the meantime, there's this connected world where we've got a bunch of us silly humans driving along with these smart cars, and that's going to be, you know, sure we might have autonomous the next couple of years, I believe we will, uh, but that's going to be for a very small part of the population. Right, we've right. got to deal with erratic, ridiculous, fallible human input for driving for the next decade, at the very least, right, if not right, even right, further. So right. during that time, rather than have a probe sample set of what speed is going on and, and what drivers are doing, there's very key elements, like right out here in front of you guys, it's a, it's a busy tech corridor. Why wouldn't you want to have perfect information on that? We can provide that very low cost, very easily, and then we will send that and, and basically publish it to all consumers. So a Verizon and an AT&T and a Sprint and a T-Mobile and all the other carriers could consume that data and put it into their connected cars and into their mapping apps. So is there is there a standard um, definition? So you take from all the variety of sensors, you're converting basically raw video data mm -hmm. and, and yep. some other raw data into uh, some machine readable what, what's actually happening yep. and then publishing that out as you said to, to a variety of potential sources as right. an exchange could be to Google and Waze, could right. be to Ford and Toyota, yep. could be to um, the, the fire department and, and the UPS uh, and FedEx. The UPS Think FedEx. how many millions of dollars a day they waste when they wait in traffic right, go right. the wrong way. So is there now, is, is or are you creating kind of that standard definition of what is definition. happening that can then feed all yes. these other things through the APIs? Yeah, the standards have not been written for this yet. We're literally writing the standards as we launch these first pilots. So we just were awarded yesterday a, a USDOT uh, granted project uh, down in Florida where we're taking LiDAR data and publishing it to DSRC. Uh, and then what's, the next, what's DSRC? so I'm sorry, DSRC is direct short range communications. Okay. So, um, and this actually, thank you for asking. So 15 years ago, the USDOT uh, and the FCC created the space of uh, bandwidth that's kept aside for cars to talk to each other. Uh, that was 99 that Congress they set alighted. it aside in 99. They set it aside, but we haven't used it. Now they're about to take half of Who it back. Who is the ingenious person that set that aside in 1999? I know them. I'll, I'll introduce you to them. They're, they're some good folks, and wow, they're still thinking waiting. Of, thinking ahead. Well, but they, the vision was there, but the execution was not. Right, so right. Uh, I, at IBM, I started an intelligent transportation practice. I had three friends in my family. That's why you keep saying smart cities. You got yeah. the IBM. Roof. Well, I, we called it. <laughs> so it first was called Community Wide Broadband, okay, and okay. I owned that globally at IBM. Worst name. I didn't pick it. We then migrated to digital cities. Um, it 
was a lot more about fire and police response and those types of things. So as it as I was leaving, they they started the Smarter Planet thing, and it right, became Smarter right. Cities after I left. But Smarter Cities, the last ten years, eight years at least, have been kind of di dictated by solar, uh, LED lighting, um, you know, smart grids, and, and electric cars. It hasn't been what I traditionally thought when we you know, founded Smarter City and Digital Cities was it's how do I get people routed home, routed to work, routed to the fire? How do I get the goods delivered in the most efficient manner? How do right. I measure it? And right. uh, my old boss, uh, when, when I was at, uh, you know, boss's boss way back at, went to GE at, up the chain, but um, uh, Jack Welsh used to say you can't manage what you can't what measure, you can't measure right, right? right? And that's what we do is we give you a, a more accurate measurement. Right now, you kind of got to guess. It's kind of like managing by, you know, with right. your blindfold on. So this is the whole idea of, of measuring in great detail and publishing it out so people can actually make decisions for themselves. Right. So one of the key themes we see over and over again, not just in this space, but all over the space, right, is you want to use a combination of your proprietary data, mm -hmm. uh, existing open data, right. and then apply your proprietary algorithms to that data that's to exactly get a competitive right. advantage. And that's really what you're talking yeah. about here. So, but on the standards part, so you know, and the other big thing, obviously, is open source, right? And, mm -hmm. and there's a conversation about, you know, open contribution to these right. mapping projects in, in the other room. Is this kind of an open source kind of initiative, or is it more kind of a standards initiative to get that that definition of the thing that you're going to be trading on your exchange? So Eric from, from Mapbox just opened up with, a, and he always does a great job, um, but he, he talked about, you know, open is not free. And what you free see like is like a puppy, we like to say. Well, yeah, <laughs> yeah that's a good way to look at it. Um, if you look at open data initiatives in New York City and San Francisco and a lot of these places got out early, what they were doing was just putting a bunch of spreadsheets online, right? So that's open, but it's not useful. Right, so what? Right. So why not have a monetized organization, a way, a mechanism to be able to make that usable? Right. So if they've got servers with uh, in their basements of City Hall full of data that you and I could use, but they have no way how to get it out. That's what we help them do, is we right. help them get it out. Right. They might have censored data in their cabinets right. that we're gonna help get out, we're right. gonna release. So that's why it's an AT&T, Verizon, Sprint, and kind of a, a network thing, is that there's there's data we gotta get out of the cabinets, back into City Hall, back into the traffic management centers, but then we've gotta publish it out. Right. And, get out, and, and those standards have not been written well, yet. Well, I was thinking more on the standard side. So yeah, it's open, it's available. But then, in but terms of kind of a methodology for, for creating yep. standards, right. you know, we've seen this rise of open source yep. software um, become really more of the mechanism that defines the standards versus, say, a regulatory body. But, right. look, but we still have that, right? 5G, they're still arguing about what the 5G is going to look like. So in your Great case, point. is it going to be more, you think, the community coming together and defining this, this open standard API that we can all share to to our benefit, or do you see it as more of a, regula a regulatory kind of a, or a, no, a trade association or it's kind a of former. a thing? At best, we'll okay. have trade associations helping us out, but I think it'll be the industry coming together and doing it. So, so for instance, um, we've got in, uh, in, in one of our major metros, we've got a wrong-way driver system where we're using their existing cameras, and we're just watching for wrong-way drivers with machine vision 24-7. Then we, uh, when we get a wrong-way driver hit, we take it to machine learning, and we start using AI to try to you know, get rid of the false positives because, you know, sometimes a truck's shadow going down a road on the other side of the road could look to machine vision right, like right, another truck, right? right? So it's, it's how do we break that out? So we, we have those algorithms. Then it goes to a human where they say yes or no, this is a wrong way driver. Um, if it's a no, that goes back into the AI to make it better for next time. But if it's a yes, we don't think just trying to put on flashing lights for the drunk or the suicidal person driving down the road is what we want to do. We want to get a hold of the UPS truck, the Uber drivers, your Ford with connected car through AT&T, right? We want to get it out to the people coming down the road and warn the innocents. So that standard we're literally writing now and publishing, and then the more people we get to consume that, you know, we'll, we'll try to get a, a blessing or a USDOT thing on it later on, right, but right, right now we can't wait for them right, to make a ruling. Right. We're just publishing that out, and we've already integrated to Ericsson and AT&T. That alert is going out right now. So and does it go out via like the Amber Alert system? Yes, or is exact that, great okay. way to put it. It's, okay. it's exact same type of a system. But the nice thing is Heads instead up of car coming at you, right? But we can localize it because right, if it's in right. my connected car, my connected car knows where it is, so I can send it out with a fence with around it, with a road. Fence, so it's right. not waking you up when you're sleeping in a hotel next to the road, right? right? right. It's not going to wake you up at three in the morning because there's a wrong way driver. It's going to know that your phone's sitting your, you know, at your bedside right. table's not moving. Right. But when you're moving down the road, and I can I can now say it's on that that street and there is a, a, a danger and wrong way driver is just the first i mean how many times have you come over a hill go around a corner all of a sudden there's a there's a stop and one of the interesting things we've been working in our research is you know they got this idea that the cars will do it themselves right this right, car will all talk to each will other fast right, break and yeah and well so i and we, we had this great example of this it was a busy busy four 
lane intersection and there was a truck up ahead that I just happened to, to spot hit its brakes and that would have triggered an alert had this system been deployed. And the particular carrier I was working with on this project to say, well, if you'd have sent this back over the hill, you would have caused me to hit my brakes for absolutely no reason. So this whole idea that hard braking always indicates that you should slow down or there's an accident is false. Yes, it's a leading indicator. It can help us say, okay, let's look maybe a little bit tighter right, right. and see. But what happened was I saw the smoke come up. I saw him break. And then I saw the lucky so Prius break. He slammed on the brake. He slammed on the brake. He blocked it up. And then this silly Prius driver comes out on the other side who was the luckiest Prius driver in Nashville that day because he cut in front of him right. and fought for that right. guy. But, if, but in that speed with that density of traffic, you know, if you send back that alert, you're just going to cause that wave going back. Right. So what you'd rather do is say it's getting a little bit tight. I mean, what if what if you as a pay as you drive uh, insurance uh, user say I want a lower rate if I drive safer? And what if we could publish through your let's say Allstate or Progressive or uh, State Farm? What if we're publishing out to your pay as you drive and and you get a warning saying if you want to keep your low rates, we'd like you to take it down to about 50 right now because you're about to come into an area where we've looked at the predictability is that there's likely to be a an accident right, within the next right. few minutes, and we like you not to be that person, and that you adjust your speed accordingly, and you keep your low drive rate. On your phone, and the thing just does it automatically, right? <laughs> when it drives <laughs> itself, it'll probably do it automatically, <laughs> and we're looking forward to that too. So this is really some really interesting examples on on the tying these things together for a real specific benefit. I'm just curious to get your perspective on kind of how much of the infrastructure is in place at the cities in terms of the sensors and cameras and I'm sure that you know the red light cameras were you know probably yeah. a big motivator to get some of those things in yep. and I don't know can you is it you know are we 20 percent of, of, of what they would like in right. place for you to do what you want to do are they 50 percent are they 80 percent you know kind of where is that and and who are the leaders um city-wise with the infrastructure where you can deploy to the best right. benefit of your vision? I'll say every city has a significant amount of infrastructure already out there, especially in the way of cameras. There's literally millions of cameras deployed. Um, and what do those feed mainly now? So like, right now the police will use them for stakeouts, for looking in. Uh, traffic will use them to respond to accidents. But what people don't understand as common drivers is that it's not that they're looking at the cameras to try to see where there's traffic. They're getting 911 calls and they're using the camera to replace the helicopter. Or they're using the camera to see what do I need to dispatch? Do I need to dispatch an ambulance? To so, get eyes on To get eyes site. on. Okay. But they're not, in, and there's some analytics out there for certain, and we take those analytics in as well. There's already a video analytic on it. We'll take that video analytic right. into our engine, and that, that works just fine. We've got examples of that in a couple of the smarter cities. So there's smarter cities in Atlanta and San Francisco and Chicago. Columbus, Ohio, obviously, is great. Austin, Dallas, Miami, um, Jacksonville. I mean, there's a lot of, uh, of interesting cities that are doing some great things um, with that are not as much in the spotlight, that are are wanting to, to really jump ahead and leap ahead. So we're working with some, some key alliances, some majors, right? Um, our platform runs on Microsoft Azure. Um, we selected it very specifically because it works um, so well in the IoT world. We actually have their IoT platform that we've built this on. So our platform will basically, if you if you call me tomorrow and said, here's a video feed in Minneapolis, we'll have data pumping through our Smarter City Exchange. It's called the Digital Streets Platform. We'll have it pumping out tomorrow. And so then if you've got a Ford car that's on the other side of that, it'll have data whatever city it's in. So that's why we say it's an exchange. And, and should it be open? Absolutely. But there's got to be ways to monetize it. Right, so right. You, it might be ad-sponsored. It might be subscription-based. It might be subsidized by your car or carrier or your, your insurance uh, provider because they want you to have a safer ride or better ride. Crazy times, because the whole thing's flipping up. To, I mean, it new is. models, new forms yep. of transportation, new yep. forms of propulsion. That's why the autonomous vehicle and just it's gonna be fascinating. The, the mobility space in general is so, yep. so exciting right now. Well, uh, Christian, thanks for taking a few minutes you. out of your day. I'll let you get back to the, uh, to the conference. There's some, <laughs> some great presentations that yep. going on. Looking forward to it. All right, he's Christian Thank Cotter. You. I'm Jeff Frick. You're watching theCUBE. We are at the mapping and navigation portion of the Auto Tech Council Innovation in Motion. Thanks for watching.